History of refrigeration. Refrigeration is a process of removing heat, which means cooling an area or a substance below the environmental temperature. Mechanical refrigeration makes use of the evaporation of a liquid refrigerant, which goes through a cycle so that it can be reused. The main cycles include vapor compression, absorption steam jet or steam ejector, and airing. The term, refrigerator, was first introduced by a Maryland farmer Thomas Moore in 1803. But it is in the 20th century that the appliance we know today first appeared. People used to find various ways to preserve their food before the advent of mechanical refrigeration systems. Some preferred using cooling systems of ice or snow, which meant that diets would have consisted of very little fresh food or fruits and vegetables, but mostly of bread, cheese, and salted meals. For milk and cheeses, it was very difficult to keep them fresh, so such foods were usually stored in a cellar or window box. In spite of those measures, they could not survive rapid spoilage. Later on, people discovered that adding such chemical as sodium nitrate or potassium nitrate to water could lead to a lower temperature. In 1550 when this technique was first recorded, people used it to cool wine, as was the term, to refrigerate. Cooling drinks grew very popular in Europe by 1600, particularly in Spain, France, and Italy. Instead of cooling water at night, people used a new technique, rotating long-necked bottles of water which held dissolved saltpeter. The solution was intended to create very low temperatures and even to make ice. By the end of the 17th century, iced drink including frozen juices and liquors tad become extremely fashionable in France. People's demand for ice soon became strong. Consumers' soaring requirement for fresh food, especially for green vegetables, resulted in reform in people's dieting habits between 1830 and the American Civil War. Accelerated by a drastic expansion of the urban areas arid the rapid amelioration in an economy of the populace. With the growth of the cities and towns, the distance between the consumer and the source of food was enlarged. In 1799s as a commercial product, Ice was first transported out of Canal Street in New York City to Charleston, South Carolina. Unfortunately, this transportation was not successful because when the ship reached the destination, little ice left. Frederick Tudor and Nathaniel Wyeth, two New England businessmen, grasped the great potential opportunities for ice business and managed to improve the storage method of ice in the process of shipment. The acknowledged ice king in that time, Tudor concentrated his efforts on bringing he ice to the Tropica One areas. In order to achieve his goal and guarantee the ice to arrive at the destination safely he tried many insulating materials in an experiment and successfully constructed the ice containers, which reduced the ice loss from 66% to less than 8% at drastically. Wyeth invented an economical and speedy method to cut the ice into uniform blocks, which had a tremendous positive influence on the ice industry. Also, he improved the processing techniques for storing, transporting and distributing ice with less waste. When people realized that the ice transported from the distance was not as clean as previously thought and gradually caused many health problems, it was more demanding to seek the clean natural sources of ice. To make it worse, by the 1890s water pollution and sewage dumping made clean ice even more unavailable. The adverse effect first appeared in the blowing industry, and then seriously spread to such sectors as meat packing and dairy industries. As a result, the clean, mechanical refrigeration was considerately in need. Many inventors with creative ideas took part in the process of inventing refrigeration, and each version was built on the previous discoveries. Dr. William Cullen initiated to study the evaporation of liquid under the vacuum conditions in 1720. 
He soon invented the first man-made refrigerator at the University of Glasgow in 1748 with the employment of ethyl ether boiling into a partial vacuum. American inventor Oliver Evans designed the refrigerator firstly using vapor rather than liquid in 1805. Although his conception was not put into practice in the end, the mechanism was adopted by an American physician John Gorey who made one cooling machine similar to Evans in 1842 with the purpose of reducing the temperature of the patient with yellow fever in a Florida hospital. Until 1851, Evans obtained the first patent for mechanical refrigeration in the USA. In 1820, Michael Faraday, a Londoner, first liquefied ammonia to cause cooling. In 1859, Ferdinand Carré from France invented the first version of the ammonia water cooling machine. In 1873, Carl von Linde designed the first practical and portable compressor refrigerator in Munich. And in 1876 he abandoned the methyl ether system and began using ammonia cycle. Linde later created a new method, Lind technique for liquefying large amounts of air in 1894. Nearly a decade later, this mechanical refrigerating method was adopted subsequently by he meatpacking industry in Chicago. Since 1840, cars with the refrigerating system had been utilized to deliver and distribute milk and butter. Until 1860, most seafood and dairy products were transported with cold chain logistics. In 1867, refrigerated, railroad cars are patented to J.B. Sutherland from Detroit, Michigan, who invented insulated cars by installing the ice bunkers at the end of the cars. Air came in from the top, passed through the bunkers, circulated through the cars by gravity and controlled by different quantities of hanging flaps which caused different air temperatures. Depending on the cargo, such as meat, fruits, etc., transported by the cars, different car designs came into existence. In 1867, the first refrigerated car to carry fresh fruit was manufactured by Parker Earl of Illinois, who shipped strawberries on the Illinois Central Railroad. Each chest was freighted with 100 pounds of ice and 200 quarts of strawberries. Until 1949, the trucking industry began to be equipped with the refrigeration system with a roof-mounted cooling device. Invented by Fred Jones, from the late 1800s to 1929, the refrigerators employed toxic gases, methyl chloride, ammonia, and sulfur dioxide, as refrigerants. But in the 1920s, a great number of lethal accidents took place due to the leakage of methyl chloride out of refrigerators. Therefore, some American companies started to seek some secure methods of refrigeration. Frigidaire detected a new class of synthetic refrigerants called halocarbons or CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, in 1928. This research led to the discovery of chlorofluorocarbons, Freon, which quickly became the prevailing material in compressor refrigerators. Freon was safer for the people in the vicinity but in 1973 it was discovered to have detrimental effects on the ozone layer. After that, new improvements were made, and hydrofluorocarbons, with no known harmful effects, was used in the cooling system. Simultaneously, nowadays, chlorofluorocarbons, CFS, are no longer used. They are announced illegal in several places, making the refrigeration far safer than before. The Evolutionary Mystery Crocodile Survives A. Even though crocodiles have existed for 200 million years, they're anything but primitive. As Crocodile's Ancestors
Crocodilia came to adapt to an aquatic lifestyle. When most of the other contemporary reptiles went extinct, crocodiles were able to make it because their bodies changed and they adapted better to the climate. They witnessed the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, which once ruled the planet. And even the 65 million years of alleged mammalian dominance didn't wipe them off. Nowadays, the crocodiles and alligators are not that different from their prehistoric ancestors. Which proves that they were, and still are, incredibly adaptive. B. The first crocodile-like ancestors came into existence approximately 230 million years ago. And they had many of the features which make crocodiles natural and perfect stealth hunters. Streamlined body, long tail, protective armor and long jaws. They are bomb with four short, webbed legs. But this does not mean that their capacity to move on the ground shall ever be underestimated. When they move... They are so fast that you won't even have any chance to try making the same mistake again by getting too close, especially when they're hunting. C. Like other reptiles. Crocodiles are poikilothermal animals, commonly known as cold-blooded, whose body temperature changes with that of the surroundings, and consequently require exposure to sunlight regularly to raise body temperature. When it is too hot, they would rather stay in water or shade. Compared with mammals and birds, crocodiles have a slower metabolism, which makes them less vulnerable to food shortage. In the most extreme case, a crocodile can slow its metabolism down even further, to the point that it would survive without food for a whole year, enabling them to outlive mammals in relatively volatile environments. D. Crocodiles have a highly efficient way to prey catching. The prey rarely realizes there might be a crocodile under the water because the crocodile makes a move without any noise or great vibration when spotting its prey. It only keeps its eyes above the water level. As soon as it feels close enough to the victim, it jerks out of the water with its wide open jaws. Crocodiles are successful because they are capable of switching feeding methods. It chases after fish and snatches birds at the water surface, hides in the waterside bushes in anticipation of a gazelle, and when the chance to ambush presents itself, the crocodile dashes forward, knocks the animal out with its powerful tail and then drags the prey into the water to drown. E. In many crocodilian habitats, the hot season brings drought that dries up their hunting grounds leaving it harder for them to regulate body temperatures. This actually allowed reptiles to rule. For instance, many crocodiles can protect themselves by digging holes and covering themselves in mud, waiting for months without consuming any food or water until the rains finally return. They transform into a quiescent state called estivation. F. The majority of crocodilian is considered to go into estivation during the dry season. In a six-year study by Kennett and Christian, the king crocodiles, a species of Australian freshwater crocodiles, spent nearly four months a year underground without access to water resources. Doubly labeled water was applied to detect field metabolic rates and water flux, and during some years, Plasma fluid samples were taken once a month to keep track of the effects of estivation regarding the accumulation of nitrogenous wastes and electrolyte concentrations. G. The study discovered that the crocodile's metabolic engines function slowly, creating waste and exhausting water and fat reserves. Waste is stored in the urine, becoming more and more concentrated. Nevertheless, the concentration of waste products in blood doesn't fluctuate much, allowing the crocodiles to carry on their normal functions. Besides, even though the crocodiles lost water reserves and body weight when underground, the losses were proportional, upon emerging. The estivating animals had no dehydration and displayed no other harmful effects such as a slowed-down growth rate. 
The two researchers reckon that this capacity of crocodiles to get themselves through the harsh times and the long starvation periods is sure to be the answer to the crocodilian line's survival. Throughout history, Elephant Communication O'Connell Rodwell, a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, has traveled to Namibia's first ever wildlife reserve to explore the mystical and complicated realm of elephant communication. She, along with her colleagues, is part of a scientific revolution that started almost 20 years ago. This revolution has made a stunning revelation. Elephants are capable of communicating with each other over long distances with low-frequency sounds, also known as infrasounds, which are too deep for humans to hear. As might be expected, African elephants able to detect seismic sound may have something to do with their ears. The hammer bone in an elephant's inner ear is proportionally huge for a mammal. But it is rather normal for animals that use vibrational signals. Thus, it may be a sign that suggests elephants can use seismic sounds to communicate. Other aspects of elephant anatomy also support that ability. First, their massive bodies, which enable them to give out low-frequency sounds almost as powerful as the sound a jet makes during takeoff, serve as ideal frames for receiving ground vibrations and transmitting them to the inner ear. Second, the elephant's toe bones are set on a fatty pad, which might be of help when focusing vibrations from the ground into the bone. Finally, the elephant has an enormous brain that sits in the cranial cavity behind the eyes in line with the auditory canal. The front of the skull is riddled with sinus cavities, which might function as resonating chambers for ground vibrations. It remains unclear how the elephants detect such vibrations. But O'Connell Rodwell raises a point that the pachyderms are listening with their trunks and feet instead of their ears. The elephant trunk may just be the most versatile appendage in nature. Its utilization encompasses drinking, bathing, smelling, feeding and scratching. Both trunk and feet contain two types of nerve endings that are sensitive to pressure. One detects infrasonic vibration, and another responds to vibrations higher in frequencies. As O'Connell Rodwell sees, this research has a boundless and unpredictable future. Our work is really interfaced at geophysics, neurophysiology and ecology, she says. We're raising questions that have never even been considered before. It has been well known to scientists that seismic communication is widely observed among small animals, such as spiders, scorpions, insects and quite a lot of vertebrate species like white-lipped frogs, blind mole rats, kangaroo rats and golden moles. Nevertheless, O'Connell Rodwell first argued that a giant land animal is also sending and receiving seismic signals. I used to lay a male planthopper on a stem and replay the calling sound of a female. And then the male one would exhibit the same kind of behavior that happens in elephants. He would freeze, then press down on his legs, move forward a little, then stay still again. I find it so fascinating. And it got me thinking that perhaps auditory communication is not the only thing that is going on. Scientists have confirmed that an elephant's capacity to communicate over long distance is essential for survival, especially in places like Atasha, where more than 2,400 savanna elephants range over a land bigger than New Jersey. It is already difficult for an elephant to find a mate in such a vast wild land, and the elephant reproductive biology only complicates it. Breeding herds also adopt low-frequency sounds to send alerts regarding predators. Even though grown-up elephants have no enemies else than human beings, 
Baby elephants are vulnerable and are susceptible to lions and hyenas attack. At the sight of a predator, older ones in the herd will clump together to form protection before running away. We now know that elephants can respond to warning calls in the air. But can they detect signals transmitted solely through the ground? To look into that matter, the research team designed an experiment in 2002, which used electronic devices that enabled them to give out signals through the ground at Mashara. The outcomes of our 2002 study revealed that elephants could indeed sense warning signals through the ground, O'Connell Rodwell observes. Last year, an experiment was set up in the hope of solving that problem. It used three different recordings, the 1994 warning call from Mishara, an anti-predator call recorded by scientist Joyce Poole in Kenya and a made-up warble tone. The data I've observed to this point implies that the elephants were responding the way I always expected. However, the fascinating finding is that the anti-predator call from Kenya, which is unfamiliar to them, caused them to gather around. Tense up and rumble aggressively as well, but they didn't always flee. I didn't expect the results to be that clear-cut.